Today we're going to talk about effective values for voltage and current waveforms. Um, some of you may not even know that you've been using effective values, at least for voltages, um, your entire time that you've ever tried to learn anything about uh, electrical appliances or things like that. Uh, so let me explain what I mean. I have tried to draw here uh, a picture of a single receptacle that would be common in a U.S. household. Um, so we have a long place here in which an electrical terminal will be inserted. This is connected to the neutral wire that's running to your junction box or, or circuit breaker. Um, the shorter one here, which you'll see in uh, polarized appliances, goes to the hot wire which runs to your breaker box. And then not all outlets are going to have this, but most modern ones do. This guy is connected to your ground wire. And the ground wire isn't actually part of the electrical system, um, so to speak. So it doesn't form a part of the closed circuit. It's external for um, overcurrent protection and things like that, a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Uh, but what you may have heard is that the potential difference between the hot wire and the neutral wire is 120 volts. Now, uh, if this were in a live classroom setting, I would ask a question. Uh, and that question is, is this 120 volts DC? Um, the short answer to that question is no but it's also not 120 volts AC. This is where the concept of an effective value comes in. So the real AC signal that is being generated, uh, so the potential difference between the hot wire and the neutral wire in this case, would be V of T is equal to 169.706, little bit of rounding there, cosine, uh, since here in America we operate at an excitation frequency of 60 hertz, 60 hertz times 2 pi to convert it to omega would be 120 pi. And then our phase angle will be just representative of whatever point in time we start looking at this signal, so it's not terribly important. And this would be measured in volts. Now this formulation is a little bit awkward and it would be tedious to carry through in all calculations involving how to set up the wiring of a home or how to design an appliance or anything like that. So what we use instead is this 120 volts which is an effective value. Um, so let me explain then what exactly an effective value is. An effective value is a DC representation of an AC signal that by definition delivers the same amount of power to an arbitrary resistance. We can develop a mathematical relationship to convert an AC or time varying, it really just needs to be periodic. Beyond that, it doesn't have to be strictly sinusoidal. It could be a periodic sum of exponential functions or, or anything that we want. It could be square waves, triangular waves, um, just any periodic function. So for, um, our, for a periodic function, let's start there. We know that P average should be 1 over 
the period multiplied by the integral over exactly one period of, since we're looking at a resistance, the power we could represent as um, the voltage waveform squared divided by the resistance. We're integrating with respect to time. And for a DC circuit, or system, we know that the average power is simply the DC voltage squared divided by the resistor value. So, what I'm going to do to determine my effective value is set these two average powers equal to each other, where one is expressing the signal in terms of its periodic function, and this VDC term is going to be the DC representation of this um, periodic waveform. So I'm setting this system up and solving for this quantity VDC. Um, so I'm going to have 1 divided by T, integral from 0 to T, of V of T squared over R dT is equal to VDC, where this is going to be my effective value, squared, divided by R. And notice that since R is a constant, I have a 1 over R factor here and a 1 over R factor on the right-hand side of my equal sign. Those guys cancel each other out. So that gives me 1 divided by T, integral 0 to T of V squared dt is equal to VDC squared. And now it's pretty simple to see that VDC, which is the effective value of the voltage, waveform V of t, is simply the square root of 1 divided by t integral over one period of the time varying waveform with respect to time. And I could do an extraordinarily similar derivation for current signals, um, where instead of having V squared over R here, I'd have I squared times R, and then I DC squared times R, the R's would still cancel out. And I would find that the effective value of a current waveform, which I'll call I DC, is 1 over T integral from 0 to T of our periodic current waveform squared. So these are our two expressions for finding the effective value of a voltage and the effective value of a current. I just want to reiterate one last time, they are the identical expressions. Uh, but when we want the voltage, we put the voltage waveform into the equation. And when we want the effective value of the current, we put the uh, periodic current waveform into our expression. Uh, when we come back, we'll work a few example problems that will help illustrate this point. So here is the first waveform that we are going to find the effective value for. It's uh, composed of triangular pulses and rectangular pulses um, mixed together. Uh, so it might seem like it's going to be kind of difficult. Uh, but in al actuality, it's going to be pretty simple. Uh, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to define uh, one period of this function as a piecewise voltage waveform. And I'm going to define one period uh, to be from here at t is equal to zero. I guess I should have labeled these, but it'll be okay. And uh, two, t is equal to six. So this is exactly one period. T is equal to 6 seconds. So I'm measuring from when my value is at 10 and starts to decrease to the next time my value is 10 and starts to decrease. So this represents from 0 to 6, represents one cycle. Um, and it takes 6 seconds for that cycle to occur. So the period of this periodic waveform is T is equal to 6 seconds. Hopefully nothing too wild or crazy there. 
Um, to express my piecewise voltage, let's see, V of T, it's going to have three parts. Um, so the first part here is a linear function. Um, it has a slope of negative 5 volts per second. So negative 5 volts per second times the time. And it has a y-intercept of positive 10 units, so 5t plus 10 volts over the time interval from 0 less than t less than 2 seconds. Over this time interval from 2 seconds to 4 seconds, it has a constant value of 6 volts. And I'm going to use the time shifting property that we learned in pre-calculus to develop a relation for this guy between 4 and 6. Um, so I'm going to consider t is equal to 4 to be my new um, 0. And, and what I mean by that is I'm time shifting this whole thing to the right by 4 units. So I'm going to have the slope multiplied by t minus 4, which is indicative of my time shift to the right by 4 units. Uh, my slope in this case, it increases 10 units in 2 seconds, so that's going to be positive 5 t minus 4. And my intercept at t is equal to 4 is 0, so this is my expression, 5 times t minus 4 volts for 4 seconds is less than t is less than 6 seconds. This is my piecewise definition for my voltage over exactly one period. If we wanted to make sure that everything is all hunky-dory, if we plug in 4 seconds, we get a voltage of 0. If we plug in 6 seconds, we get 5 times 2 is 10 volts. And we have a linear relationship, so this seems like it checks out. All right, so our effective value, VDC, is by definition the square root of 1 over the period times the integral over 1 period of our voltage waveform squared, and it's very important that you square it, dt, like so. Uh, so now we're going to substitute in some things, right? So our period is 1, or excuse me, is 6 seconds, so we're going to have 1 6 and what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to split my integral into three parts because there are three distinct pieces of our voltage waveform over one period. So I'm going to have one integral that goes from 0 to 2 representing this portion of our signal. And I'm going to have negative 5t plus 10, this whole quantity squared, dt. Then I'm going to have a second integral from 2 to 4 of just 6 squared dt, because my function has a constant value over this time interval. And lastly, I'm going to have integral from 4 to 6 of 5 t minus 4 quantity squared dt. Close that bracket and make sure that my square root sign extends. So I'm integrating over exactly one period because the total, the, the, the bottom limit of this integration is 0 and the top limit of this integration piece is 6. So I'm, I'm integrating over the whole period. I've just split it up into three distinct portions because I have a piecewise function. If I, were, if I had a continuous function, I wouldn't need to do this part, um, but because I have a um, piecewise function, I have to split up my integral. So I just want to be clear on what I'm doing. All right, so let's see what's going to fall out of this guy. Integral from 0 to 2. Alrighty, so negative 5t plus 10 quantity squared. 
So that's going to be negative 5t times negative 5t gives me 25t squared. Negative 5t times 10 gives me negative 50t. Uh, and then 10 times negative 5t gives me another negative 50t. So this is going to be minus 100t. And then 10 times 10 gives me plus 100. Two to four, six squared is just 36. So that fits pretty easy. And then this guy uh, is going to be a little bit harder to do, but not a whole heck of a lot. So we could write this as 5t minus 20. Um, so we have 5t times 5t is 25t squared. 5t minus 20 is minus 100t. And we're going to double it. So minus 200t. And then negative 20 times negative 20 gives me positive 400. And there we go. Close off this. Extend my square root sign. Alrighty. So now we're going to have 1, 6. And I'm <clears throat> excuse me, well aware that at this point you guys could just throw this stuff in your calculator um, and get the answers for each of the distinct parts and do it. But we're working it by hand, so we're just going to continue to keep on plugging away at this guy. Um, so we are going to have, let's see, open this guy up. Uh, so the integral of 25t squared is going to be 25t cubed over 3 minus 100t squared over 2 plus 100t evaluated at t is equal to 2 and 0 plus, uh, let's see, so 36t, and I'm going to get 4 and 2, plus 25t squared, excuse me, t cubed, over 3, minus 200t over t squared over 2, plus 400t, this thing at 6 and 4. Looking like I'm running out of room here, uh, but I think we'll be able to finish it in time, or finish it in space, I guess would be a better way to express that. Um, all right, so let's see. So this is going to be 25 times T, uh, 2 cubed over 3 minus 100 times 2 squared over 2 plus 100 times 2 plus, let's see, 36. Um, so here, or minus 36 times 2. Uh, so the reason I don't have any minuses over here per se, is because I know that at zero, this is going to go to zero, this is going to go to zero, this is going to go to zero, so just wasting space. Um, plus 25 times 6 cubed over 3 minus 25 times 4 cubed over 3 minus 200 times 6 squared over 2 minus 200 times 4 squared over 2 plus 400, if I'm running out of room here, uh, 6 minus 4 is how that's going to work out. Close my bracket. And if I put this big ugly mathematical thing into my calculator, I actually get 5.85 volts. 
so one thing that I'm going to do right now um, is I'm going to change my unit ever so slightly. And I'm going to use a new unit to define an or to, uh, that will be used whenever we have an effective value. So instead of just calling this volts, I'm going to call this volts RMS. What this RMS stands for is root mean squared. Because we are taking the square root, by the square root signal, of the arithmetic mean, or the average, of the square of our waveform. So that's why it's RMS. So the effective value for this waveform is 5.85 volts RMS. So if we applied this particular waveform to any resistance, it would absorb, as uh, the resistor would absorb exactly as much power as if we applied a 5.85 volt signal to that same, very same resistor. Um, so that's why we have a DC representation of this periodic signal. Uh, when we kind of, excuse me, when we come back, we will um, kind of tie things up by looking specifically at a sinusoidal function. Uh, so now we're going to look at a simple sinusoidal function. Um, and it's going to be generic. So we can say that I of t, in this case, is the magnitude I am cosine omega, whatever omega happens to be, t plus some phase angle theta i amps. Um, one thing to point out, uh, and we've already covered this in our sinusoidal review lecture, is that there is a relationship between omega and the period, right? So just to be clear here, I'm going to define the period to be the time interval between um, successive positive peaks. I could have done it between successive zero crossings or negative peaks or however I wanted to do it, um, but I'm, I'm just going to define the, the period in this way. Um, so we know that omega is equal to 2 pi times the linear frequency, f, and f is equal to the inverse of the period. So this gives us omega is equal to 2 pi divided by capital T, and therefore we can see that capital T, the period, is simply 2 pi divided by omega. All right, so recognizing that, let's look at our formula. Um, so the DC equivalent of this periodic uh, sinusoidal signal will be the square root of 1 over the period multiplied by the integral over 1 period of the waveform squared with respect to time, by definition. So 1 over t is going to be, let's see, um, omega over 2 pi. integrating from 0 to 2 pi over omega of I am cosine omega t plus theta i quantity squared dt. We're going to use the trig identity that we used before when we had to multiply sinusoids together. Uh, so cosine times cosine is going to give us one half i m squared times the cosine of theta i minus theta i, cosine zero is one, plus one half i m squared cosine twice omega t plus twice theta i
Um, okay, and we're going to split this up into two integrals uh, just to make our life a little bit easier. So we're going to have omega over 2 pi multiplied by the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 half, excuse me, 2 pi over omega. I am squared dt plus the integral from 0 to 2 pi over omega of 1 half i m squared cosine twice omega t plus twice theta i dt. We're going to look at these parts individually. Um, so let's look at this guy here first actually. Uh, 1 half i m squared cosine twice omega t plus twice theta i. So we have a sinusoidal signal. Let me just draw a general picture of what this term is going to look like. Um, arbitrary phase angle. Something like this. Okay? Now, this is representative of I of T squared. So, uh, omega, sorry, 2 pi over omega. This distance from this peak, skipping one peak to the next peak, is the period of our original current waveform. Okay? Um, I can say this without any hesitation because I know that this guy right here, which is partially representative of the power, but it's the, the square of the current, um, is oscillating at twice the frequency. So we should see two cycles of it. Uh, so we should see two cycles of the um, one half i m squared cosine twice omega t plus twice theta i term for every single cycle we see of just i of t by itself. So what we are doing then is we are integrating this waveform over exactly two cycles, all right? And it's a sinusoid. So if we integrate the sinusoid over an integer number of cycles, by definition, Exactly half the time the signal is going to be above the horizontal axis and exactly half the time the signal is going to be below the horizontal axis. And so when we add those two bits together, this term goes to zero. So what we're left with is this guy here. This one half I m squared is a constant. So we can actually pull that out. So we're going to have the square root of omega over 2 pi multiplied by i m squared divided by 2 integral from 0 to 2 pi over omega of just dt by itself. When we integrate 1 or a constant value, um, this is going to look like the square root of omega over 2 pi times i m squared over 2 times 2 pi over omega minus 0. So this term then becomes 2 pi over omega. This omega cancels this omega. This 2 pi cancels this 2 pi. And we are left with the magnitude of the current divided by the square root of 2. So that is our effective value for our current waveform. Notice we did this for a generic sinusoid. Okay? So it doesn't matter if it's a sine function or a cosine function, you're going to get the exact same result. Notice that the answer is independent of frequency and it is independent of phase angle. It depends only on the magnitude of our waveform. 
So any time that we have a sinusoidal excitation, the effective value of that sinusoidal excitation, be it a voltage or a current, is simply the magnitude of the sinusoid divided by the square root of 2. So let's circle back around to how we started off this lecture. Okay. We had a plug, or a receptacle. And we said that in the time domain, V of T was 169.706 cosine 120 pi T plus some phase angle theta V. The effective value for this is just going to be 169.706 volts divided by the square root of 2 will give us 120 volts RMS. So this is why I said you've been using effective values the whole time. The 120 volts that most of you know that uh, a, an outlet in an American home supplies is actually the effective value. We're already using the DC equivalent because it makes the math and things like that much easier. Um, so our next lecture is going to be on the topic of complex power, and we are going to use effective values to generate power relationships in steady state sinusoidal circuits. Uh, thank you for watching.